Well, welcome to the Beyond the Lines podcast. Uh, in a world filled with so much hate and division, we want to do something about that. So our goal is to treat all people with the dignity and respect that they deserve. And whether we realize it or not, sometimes we draw lines in the sand and say, I'm not going to love beyond this line or beyond this difference. So we want to address that. And today on our podcast, we have uh, an author, we have a thought leader, and uh, also a member of our church, Central Christian Church, and that is Dr. Jeff McGee. And uh, Dr. McGee, it's so good to have you with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. That's awesome. Well, hey, we were chatting a little bit about uh, this just beforehand, but you've got a book that is recently coming out, and uh, that's a little bit what we're going to be talking about today, One Human Race. Can you just fill us in on uh, on what it is and kind of where people can find it? Yeah, yeah. So the book is just basically written to help people understand that we are one human race in God's eyes. And, uh you know, it's just a book to give people some insight into how do we build unity and collaboration within our church and within the, the church, uh, the big church, uh, the big C. And uh, so I'm just really excited about the book. I've been hearing a lot of good things about it. I'm um, really excited about that. <laughs> uh, you never know if your book's good or not, but uh, I've been getting a lot of great feedback from people all over the place. Um, but yeah, they can go to my, you can go to my website, uh, drjeffmcgee.com. And you'll see the book, uh, the link there to purchase the book. So I'm really excited to get it into the hands of as many people as uh, I can. Awesome. Well, very cool. I know you've got the uh, the paper edition and also digital on Kindle. I was hoping, you know, there was an audible where I, I just want to hear you narrate the book. Have you thought about that at all? Yeah. I've, I've thought about that, but uh, I've been advised not to do that. Okay. So, so, uh, but maybe one day, <laughs> one day. All right. Well, Hey, um, so I just want to, I just pretty much just have a conversation. Uh, you know, your book is very good, but I just want to start off from the basics kind of, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, just your journey and maybe a little bit about the work that you're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, um, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, yes, I'm a huge Steelers fan. Okay. Uh, Everyone you know. <laughs> That's tough for us Cardinals fans to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I moved out here about uh, eight years ago, and I started attending Central uh, probably about three or four years ago, I would say. Uh, I started attending Central. And, you know, just you know, I did my finished my doctorate degree uh, at, up at NAU. And um, when I got done with that or towards the tail end of that, just praying and trying to figure out what my next step is in life. And, um Kind of the goal was for me to uh, work in higher ed. I wanted to become a college or university professor um, and teaching in organizational uh, leadership, organizational um, uh, change uh, where my heart was. But, you know, God always has different plans for you. So <laughs> just through some circumstances, through prayer and uh, some things, uh, God really revealed to me this need um, it's within the church, just educating people on just how do we build unity? And how do we uh, start loving people? Um, so right now I do consulting work um, across the country uh, and different aspects of the world also. Um, and just teaching leaders how to uh, develop these organizational changes that's implementing policies that teach us how to love others, right? And create more equitable spaces um, for, for all of God's people. So I work in all, we work in all sectors, um, within the church, education, higher ed, and K-12, businesses, nonprofits. Um, we have a lot of clients in those different areas. So that's a little bit about what we do um, at the company. Yeah, well, that's really cool. And I know that's how I originally got connected with you, um, is you, know, you came and spoke to our, our staff at a meeting mm -hmm. uh, about December of 2019, actually. And uh, so that's where I first got to hear about the work that you do. And uh, yeah. personally, within my own heart, was just blown away by, by what you shared um, and kind of had my world rocked and whatnot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think your work is, uh, it, it's really powerful and really important, especially in a time like, man, if you look at the, the past year, everything has come to the forefront. Uh, you mentioned that in the introduction of your book or in the preface a little bit, you know, talking about George Floyd. And uh, it, it's just, I can't, I can't say, I mean, there's, there's no time like the present really. And uh, so I just want to thank you and commend you for what you're doing. Um, I, I know too here, let me pull up some notes really quick. 
Uh, but you've got, so in this book, some amazing thoughts. And uh, I, I circled this here, but you know, you, you've got this, you know, you said the goal of this book is twofold. First, to provide readers with a deeper understanding of culture, using race as a model to illustrate how human theories and practices have caused division within the body of Christ. And second, to introduce a framework for developing uh, biblically-based cross-cultural unity and collaboration based on the data collected through personal experiences, research, stories, church parishioners, and non-church people, church and nonprofits, uh, leadership teams, board members, and deacons. Um, so it's a lot right there. Uh, but I just kind of want to break it down, looking at that that first bit, uh, to provide readers a deeper understanding of culture uh, ra- or in using race as a model to illustrate these human theories. Um, just walk us through a little bit some of the the findings that you've had just in that and, and what you've found. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things, uh, and, I'll, and I'll start with this, when we talk about race and we talk about, uh, you know, trying to understand racism and things like that, one of the big questions I ask many people is, where did you learn about race? Um, where did you learn about racism? And I'm really intrigued by their responses because if like me and like you, we've not been taught about race through some type of educational format. We've heard it through social media. Maybe our family taught us. Um, maybe we watch on the news or read it in the newspaper. So we don't really have this full understanding of what race is from a historical uh, component. Um, and so through a lot of the research was conducted from doing one-on-one interviews with people, um, focus groups, um, doing some observations in different settings and with uh, church folks and people that aren't in, in the church and, and, and then throughout different sectors. So a, a lot of this research was done for, I've done it for years because I wanted to really establish a strong foundational understanding of how we can learn something different how people do learn. Um, and so I, was, I felt it was important before I started laying out a framework to understand how to make changes. We have to first understand what the information is <laughs> and have a really strong foundation of what race is, especially from a, um, a biblical uh, perspective. So I wanted to really lay that out and give people this, this understanding before we moved into how we can start making these changes. Yeah, no, that's good. And I know one of the the things that you bring up too is, um, you know, you, you share scripture, obviously, and you talk about the idea of, hey, it, we're, we're all from from Adam. And, you know, you look right. at Genesis and you, you bring up some scripture from Acts and uh, you bring up this, this word that some people might not be familiar with, uh, just melanin and yep. uh, just how we've got uh, just people have different amounts of melanin. And that's really um, just what... Uh, determines your skin color or how dark your skin is. Um, right. And I thought that that was a, a, a really helpful explanation because uh, that's something, you know, you don't, you don't hear growing up, you don't learn. Right. Um, and so I, I appreciated that. Right. Re- yeah. And, and that's it. When I read, when I first came across it, it, re- it kind of blew my mind too. Um, Cause I like to look at the simplicity of things and we, and I mentioned it in the book, we, we really have established these rules about different racial groups simply because of the amount of melanin in their skin, mm-hmm. which is something we cannot control. Like you're born this way. Right. <laughs> you're born this way. This is the way God made you, but yet God made you one way and then people look at you and then judge you based on the way God made you. Um, and I think that's just something that we really need to have, really meditate on and think about as we are you know, trying to build unity. No, totally, totally. And uh, I, I liked what you said here too, just uh, kind of going from that. And uh, you just wrote, building relationships across races is a lot easier when we first understand ourselves before we begin to understand others. And I think that's part of just understanding yourself. Like, hey, this is the way God made me, you know, one way or the other, whether uh, I'm, I'm lighter skinned or, or darker skinned. And I think that just helps us kind of walk through that process. So uh, in your book, Dr. McGee, you talk about um, just how there was a period uh, of your own faith and your own life where uh, you, you took a step back from Christianity, your relationship with Christ, um, and then you, you eventually kind of made that swing back. Can you just walk us through what led to 
uh, the, I would say, you know, almost a prodigal son moment of walking away and then uh, coming back and being, you know, brought into the, the fold of, of, of Christianity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I walked away from Christianity probably in my late teens, I would say, um, maybe my junior, senior year in high school. Um, I was raised in the church and um, I was raised in, in the church. I was raised in was really strict um, uh, on the rules and, and different things. And so I, I don't want to attribute that to me leaving the church, but I know that had a part of it. That was a part of it. Um, so it was just me experiencing the world, just experiencing something other than church. Um, so I walked away from church for, for many years, um, well over a decade, I would say I walked away from church. Um, and just through that, you know, I, I could, looking back on it, I see how God still had his hand on me, even though I walked away, um, from the church. And I, I came back to God in 2007. And through some uh, some experiences and circumstances where it led to me and uh, my son at that time, well, not, not that time, <laughs> but me and my son at that time were homeless um, back in 2007. Oh, wow. um, and we, and not too many people know that, but uh, I guess everyone's going to know that now. But yeah, we were homeless back in 2007. Um, the market had crashed. Um, I had lost everything, my house, my cars, everything, my job. Um, and I was a single parent at that time and just trying to find, figure out my next step in life. And around that time is when I came back to the Lord and God just started piecing my life back together again. Um, and I've been serving God ever since 2007. Uh, and it's just been an incredible journey, um, uh, during that time. So that's a little bit about my, my history of walking away and coming back. I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but you know, I, I've learned a lot of things out there in the world and I learned how much hate is out there in the world, um, just from walking away. And, uh, some of those experiences I do use in, in currently in my, my, my ministry and my work now, um, I use a lot of those experiences that inform, uh, some of the, the work that I do. So, yeah. Wow, you know, I had no clue. Uh, just even what you shared there, you know, that's new information uh, for me too. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, talking a little bit about those experiences, some of them that you had gone through. Um, are there any stories that that stick out in your mind as like, hey, this is where you know I, I really experienced or went through uh, something that that was racist in nature, and um, you know, I, share a little bit about that because uh, I think that's important to hear that. Yeah, and I, and I and before I share that, I want to say this, you know, a, a part of what's going on right now when we talk about race and understanding race is people tend to learn about race and racism from sources other than people that experienced it. Um, so when I talk about my experiences with race, I'm not making these things up. Mm. <laughs> these are things that really happened. And um, I've, I've experienced racism throughout my entire life. Um, and I probably will continue experience racism until the day God calls me home. Um, but I remember there's things that I remember, and it's funny because you know, a couple of months ago, after my mom uh, <laughs> read my book, and uh, we were just talking about some things I, I, I've experienced with racism, she actually started reminding me of some other things that happened that I just totally forgot about. Mm. Um, so there's things that I don't even remember that happened. Um, but a, a couple that, that come to mind, I remember as a kid, I remember we lived in a predominantly white uh, neighborhood. And I remember my, my brother and I were out riding our bikes. We were probably 10, 11 years old. And I remember being pulled over by the police while we were, we were actually on the street we lived on. And I remember being pulled over by the police and the police officers were questioning us and asking us why we were in this neighborhood. Wow. Um, we were actually living on the street. <laughs> uh, and I remember getting pulled over at that time. I didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were just wanting to know. Right. So it wasn't until I went home and told my parents and I don't remember their responses, but I remember my mom would just broke down. And, um, and so I still, I didn't know what was going on, but as I grew older and, I was, and another experience happened, I got pulled over uh, by the police at, um, I was with my brother and a couple of my cousins. We were just driving home. It was probably about 11 o'clock in the evening at night. Um, and we were coming home. And I remember getting 
pulled over and there was probably, I would say, 10 police cars pulled us over and at gunpoint made us get out the car, um, handcuffed us, put us against the car, searched the car. Um, we asked, I asked what we were being pulled over for. They said, you, you were speeding. Um, which I know we weren't because I knew the neighborhood <laughs> I was driving. So I knew I wasn't speeding. Um, but after that was done, they didn't even give me a ticket. They just said, okay, goodbye. You can go. They uncuffed us and, and took us away. And that was a really traumatic experience for me. Um, and that happened uh, to me. And I was saying say another one happened. Um, and I'm just picking some <laughs> yeah. from my memory. Something one happened here in, uh, in Arizona here. And I was at, uh, to the Tempe marketplace. And I was walking with uh, a friend of mine at that time. And she was a, a white female and we went into a store and I remember it was a jewelry store we went into. And I remember her and I went our separate ways, but I noticed the employees started following me. Mm-hmm. They weren't following her at all. Uh, matter of fact, I, if I remember correctly, she was actually digging in her purse near the jewelry counter which later on I told her, you know, how I would never do something like that because if I'm digging in my pockets or something in the jewelry counter, I know I'm going to be suspected of something, right? Yeah, people are going to jump remember. to the worst conclusion. Yeah, so but so I do remember that happening uh, right here in Tempe, but there's other things that happen here in Arizona too. But those are just some of the experiences of many um, that where I've experienced some type of racial profiling or racism. Um, that's really impacted my life and, and it actually has caused some trauma in, in my life that that's still I'm still trying to deal with. So um, that's just a little bit about the personal experiences that I've had here. Yeah, man, I'm sorry to hear that. I really am. I think what it it causes me to think about is uh, is how can I check biases within myself? And I think it, anybody you talk to has bias, whether they realize it or not. What is some of the, the the work you've found or uncovered, and how we, or even just biblically, like how can we challenge ourselves to just reflect, look at ourselves, and say, "Hey, why am I thinking this?" or "How does God actually want me to respond to this?" What do you What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think you know it, everything. In, in my opinion, we talk about relations. Everything's relational, right? And 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 at Central, I love you know you have that sign right behind you. We're made for more, mm-hmm. and. I, I just think, you know, it, it, it's just as simple as just sitting down with someone and talking to someone that's different than you. Um, but then having that biblical understanding that we're all God's children uh, and, and having empathy for one another. I talked about empathy just briefly before, but I think empathy is, is huge. I've met some great folks at Central just by going out and having a coffee meeting. And, and sharing my story and them sharing their story. And I've developed some great friendships with uh, people at, at Central that are different than me, um, that I, I truly value these friendships. And to my closest friends go to Central right now um, because we have been able just to sit down and break bread together and just develop an understanding and love for one another and know that we're all in God's kingdom. Um, and But the world is constantly trying to pull us apart and what I've seen is, and I, and I don't know if I'm interested in the book or not, but I, what I've seen is the world's actually crept into the church. And right now it's hard to tell the difference mm. between the church and the world because we're all acting the same. Um, and so this is where we need to, to separate ourselves, you know, and, and just start being different. And that just comes from understanding ourselves, reading our word, letting the Holy Spirit work in us. And simply in a scripture I quote a million times, it's just loving our neighbor, just loving other people. That's, that's all it is. When I say other people, it's just someone that's not you, <laughs> just loving everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, and we can just simply do that. We can just start building better relationships, a better society, um, and a better community within the church. Yeah. You know, and I think what you said, you know, love your neighbor, uh, you write it in the book and, uh, you know, as followers of Christ, hopefully we know this, like that's the second commandment, right? Like Jesus says, love God, you know, uh, put him first. But the second is to love your neighbor. And I remember back when you talked to our, our staff, uh, in December, 2019, you, you talked about this, um, not phenomenon, but just kind of the culture that was set up around, um, 
uh, I can't remember the proper word, but just uh, the railroad tracks and how that distinguished between um, certain certain neighborhoods, whether, hey, this is a white neighborhood or this is a black neighborhood. And that really got me to think and has even caused my wife and I to have a lot of conversations of, hey, like we get to choose who our neighbors are to some degree. You know, we get to choose where we want to live, you know, uh, but we don't always choose who's in the apartment or the house next door. Right. At the same time, uh, you know, we've got this call to, to love whoever uh, is near us. And so my question would be, for those of us who um, want to start maybe loving our neighbors more or just learn more about our neighbors, I know you talk about empathy and, and hearing stories. W- where do we begin? Like, how do we start? Yeah. So, and, so that goes towards kind of the second part of the book where I talk about the framework of where do we start, right? So the first part I talk about is understanding yourself, understanding your biases, understanding your worldview, understanding how you grew up. And then more importantly, how did you learn about, how did you learn this information? How did you learn about race? How did you learn about gender? Um, how did you learn about different ethnicities or nationalities? And uh, where did you learn about immigration, right? So where did you learn these things from? And once we start questioning that, we can start really analyzing where we told the truth, right? And one of the things I like to bring up is, you know, we, uh, Columbus Day, for example. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember growing up, you know, in elementary school, probably like you, we learned that Columbus founded America. Right. But we now know that that's not true. And I've always questioned that even before it started, started to become kind of a national thing is, My question was always, how can you find something that wasn't lost, right? There was already people here, so how can you find something, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So think about when you lose your keys, right, you find your keys. But you know what I mean? So it's just, it was just something that always triggered my mind. But anyway, we learn about ourselves and we start learning new information. Um, And then as we move through the model, you know, we're just learning about different cultures, learning about different people groups. And one of the things that I really, really like about um, the people that I've met with at Central is they, my, my close friends have had the heart, I would say, to say, hey, let me learn, let me lean in and learn something new. So it's having that desire to learn something new and saying, I don't know it all. And that's kind of the attitude that God wants us to have, right? Because once we start becoming a know-it-all, and we're pushing God to the side and saying, God, don't worry about it. I got this, right? But, but having the mindset, having an open mindset to say, hey, I need to learn something new. And it might shake me up at my core. But if I'm learning something new, it's going to give us that wisdom that we need as we're moving forward and trying to just build better unity and build friendships and relationships with people that are different than us. Man, that's all so good. Um you know, I think about stuff that I've learned that's, that's new in reading your book. I think, you know, you explained it a little bit, but I learned about the difference of uh, race, ethnicity, and culture and how you kind of talk about these. Could you just define those for our listeners or our viewers really quick so they just have an idea of what we're talking about? Yeah. So, and, and so one of the things with race, um, and, and in specific, I talk about the difference between race and the concept of race. Which is, which is two different things. Mm-hmm. Um, ethnicity is basically what you can create for yourself. So basically, uh, ethnicity is I'm a Christian. That's a part of my, my ethnic you know, makeup. I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. I have that choice, right? That's, that's a choice of mine. Race is not my choice. And then the concept of race that I talk about in the book is different than race. The race is the way we were were created, we're human, we're all human races, whether you're black, white, brown, yellow, red, it doesn't matter, we're a part of the human race. The concept of race is actually was developed by man. What I mean by that is man had to give meaning to the color of people's skin. So white means this, black means this, brown means this, red and yellow means this. So that's where man went wrong <laughs> because we had to give an identity meaning to what a race is. And in, in the book, and then there's other uh, literature out there that really goes deep into how that happened. 
and I go talk about how it happened here within the, the understanding of the United States um, and how the concept of race was developed through laws, through um, the courts, through um, different policies that were implemented to create this concept of race. So um, that's the difference between the, those concepts. Yeah, well, that's good. And, you know, that goes back to the title, too, even in what you said and how you define it. You know, we're saying, hey, there's one human race. The only difference is how much melanin you have in your in your skin yeah. and um, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, you talk about this idea of embracing cross-cultural collaboration. You, you alluded to it earlier, um, some of the different parts or whatnot. Um, but you, from what I gather, there's five parts. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'll read them really quick. Just understanding yourself. So having that time for self-reflection. Uh, number two, learning it all over again. Uh, number three is relating through trust. Four is advocating for a cause. And five is participating through unity. What would you say in what you found or talked with people, what's the what's the hardest one for people to kind of approach or, or work through? You know, that, that's a good question. I, 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 the hardest part for people is that first stage, hmm. the understand stage. Um, we live in a society now that, and, and, it, I, and I think it was very, very apparent in our recent political election where we've had, we have two sides that were just (laughs) polar opposites, but people didn't listen to one another because they were so ingrained in their beliefs, um, whether right or wrong, it, it doesn't matter. They were so ingrained in their beliefs that they were closed off to listening to the other side. Um, and I'm not saying that they had to change their mind, but people wouldn't even listen to other people. And that was, that just really shows how people are so ingrained and entrenched in what they believe to be true, that they're not open enough to listen to stories, listen to how someone's feeling, listen to truth. Um, I recently, I just did a a training uh, with a couple of days ago and I was talking to a group on something I heard on TV (laughs) where someone was arguing uh, this, the idea of white privilege. And this person was arguing white privilege and saying, I don't have white privilege. I earned everything that I have. And then it was just going on and on. And I had to stop and I, st- and I had to reflect on that. They were arguing something and they didn't even have the true meaning of it. So they didn't even understand what white privilege was. <laughs> so they're arguing about something that wasn't even relevant. Um, and that just showed me that people get entrenched into their beliefs and it's hard to move people out out of that, just saying, open up your mind, let's learn something new. So that first stage, if we can get past that first stage, then everything else will just fall into place. But one another thing, a point about these five stages that we have to understand, it, it, this is a lifelong journey, right? Um, walking with people, just like walking with God, is a lifelong journey. It's just not a one-time thing. You do it and you're done. Um, so that's another thing that people are, are understanding and leaning into and saying, hey, I'm being intentional about learning. I'm being intentional about advocating. I'm being intentional about unity. Um, so that's something I, I, the two things I would say uh, are, are really stand out about this model. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that just kind of blows my mind. Even you're just sharing that story of someone saying like, you yeah, no, no, I, I earned everything I have. You know, I don't, I don't have this thing called white privilege. Uh, and you yeah. talk about that in your book a little bit, you know, the idea of earned privilege. Um, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on the exact wording, um, but I thought that was really eye opening. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this is what I would challenge. And I, I say this as somebody who is, who is clearly white. Um, how can, and this may be a, a, more of a question for me, but like, uh, how can people who, who look like me, who are probably uh, brought up like me, how do we use, you know, just the color of our skin to, to work towards unity and to work towards this cross-cultural uh, collaboration like you talk about? Yeah, that, that's a good question um, because I think what people need to do, um, and I would just say for all colors, but it, it just, and I said this before, it's just sitting down at the table and being open to learning and understanding someone else's perspective. And I feel like 
and I work with a lot of groups who are mostly white. And I, and I tell people, you know, you have to start opening your mind to saying, okay, things are different now. It's not what it used to be. <laughs> our communities are more diverse. Our churches are more, more diverse. Our workforce is becoming more diverse. Um, and I'm not just talking racial, right? There's gender and, you know, ethnicity and different other cult, different cultures. We're becoming a more diverse society. And if we, we're holding on to old traditional thinking, we're not able to move forward. So, and I tell people all the time, and I, a good friend of mine said to me, you know, I, how can I get rid of my privilege? And I told him, don't get rid of it. Use your privilege to start bringing unity, right? Start talking to people that look like you about some of the, these issues, about what's going on. Um, because they are able to get into spaces that I can't get into. Right. And I've, and I've learned that <laughs> uh, throughout the years that, um, and I had someone tell me, even with a doctorate degree, I still can't get into certain spaces because of the color of my skin. Mm. And, and I, when they told me that, I, that really hit me like a ton of bricks because it's actually true. So I would say people that have privilege, and it's not just white privilege, right? There's socioeconomic privilege, right? It's privilege of where you live. Um, there's gender privilege. Um, so there's different types of privilege. Use that privilege to have conversations with people like you on how to start inviting other people that are different into these spaces to have these conversations. So that's what I would challenge, um, you know, people that have this privilege. That's yeah. I think that nails, nails it right on the head. Um, because, you know, as I've just thought, uh, and, and for me, you know, my talking point that I always go back to is that first time I heard you back in December, 2019, uh, and I think that's something that that has really resonated with me since then is, uh, you know, like you said, you can't change who you are. You know, you're born the right. way you are. God gave you what, what, what you are. Um, so how do you then utilize that situation for the very best uh, that you can and and whatnot? And so kind of going with that, you know, utilizing your situation, jumping into things, um, how do we get involved? Maybe it's a little bit easier, you know, uh, coming from a, a church background where, you know, obviously this is our conversation here is happening through Central and it's easy to get involved, but maybe you, you don't work in a church. You uh, work in, in the secular environment, you know, business or schools or, or what have you. How would you encourage uh, somebody who's in a situation like that to just get involved? Yeah, I, and I, so that's a good question because when, when you when you say that question, I'm thinking about you know the advocacy stage in, in this model, um, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer. It doesn't matter what sector you work in, that God has given us all a purpose, um, and we need to find our purpose, align our purpose with God, and we can make an impact in in whatever sector we work in. Again, it goes back to loving people, loving God first, but then loving people. And if you're passionate about whatever it is, you're going to pour your resources into it, whether it's your money, whether it's your time. Um, and uh, the pastor just uh, this past Sunday and, 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 the, and the message talked about, you know, I like giving. Mm -hmm. And it was more about it was more than money. Right. It just wasn't about money. It's about your time, your resources um, and just giving to people and purposes that are different than you. So people that want to dive into specifically racial reconciliation and building racial unity, whether in the church or in their uh, work space, again, start having conversations with people that are like you and people that are not like you start finding those barriers that are causing these conversations not to happen and start working towards rectifying these barriers um, and, and breaking down these barriers. That, that's what people can start doing. Start challenging their leadership, saying, and just ask them, what are you doing to build better uh, racial unity within our organization? Um, just, and just start asking these questions and challenging people and talking to leaders and talking to different people. Too many times we get stuck in our bubble and we don't want to get out of our bubble. But as I'll go back to what I said right behind you, we are made for more. Right, we're not made just to sit in our bubble and be comfortable. We're ba we're made for discomfort, you know. Um, and I think about you know Paul, 
in, in, in the Bible. Paul didn't work in, within the framework of being comfortable, right? Paul worked in the framework of doing God's work, doing the, you know, even if it meant going to prison, Paul went. Even if it meant getting beat, Paul did it, right? So we have to have that mindset that we have to step out into our discomfort and get rid of our comfort. Um, and that's one thing I think, and I, I don't want to go down the rabbit's trail, but that's one thing I think this pandemic has really showed me personally, that we were comfortable just being, doing our normal. But the pandemic caused us to do things that weren't normal to us, right? All of us had to do something different. Yeah. And I think because of that pandemic, it really showed me personally that there is value in discomfort. You find new things in discomfort. You find new relationships in discomfort. Um, and I think that's what we need to start leaning into is instead of operating in comfort, let's operate in discomfort. And that's where God can do some marvelous things. Amen to that. I mean, even just talking about comfort, I think of the easiest analogy for me is just working out or, you know, you, you train and uh, it, I, doesn't feel good, right? I mean, you're sore, <laughs> you, you're, you're hurting your muscles, you're ripping them essentially just to build them up and make them stronger. And mm -hmm. if anything, you know, the past year has taught us that uh, there's a lot of discomfort and uh, there's a lot that we can learn and grow from it. And, you know, you don't get to the good times without going through some of the hard times right. as well. Um, I want to yeah. change gears just a little bit here. I'm thinking, you know, uh, Jonathan, my co-host, who is on episodes with us, um, you know, young father, uh, he's got kids, and I'm hoping someday to have kids of my own. And how do you, how would you just go about to explain the idea of race to like a five-year-old? Because um, you know, we talk about learned behaviors, and we 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 sometimes say the things we do or act the way we do because we learned them. Uh, and sometimes that's positive and sometimes it's negative, but how would we just go about and explain the idea uh, of one human race in the simplest of terms for a child? For a child. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, it's one of the things that, and I get, I get asked that question sometimes by parents. Um, and one of the things I say is, you know, what are you doing as a parent to be intentional, intentional about having your child interact with kids that aren't like them. Mm. Um, again, whether it's racial or socioeconomic, um, whatever the difference is, what are you doing to be more intentional about that? If you're raising your kids in a bubble, <laughs> you're going to get stuck. They're going to get stuck in that bubble and, and believe that this bubble is actually true. Like that this is reality. This is the way things should be. But if you're giving your kids these experiences with different cultures at a young age, the kid's going to start naturally um, start understanding, you know, that yes, I might be different than this person, but I can still play with this kid, right? We've seen all these images of the, the five-year-old or maybe even younger than that, of the black kid and the white kid that were running toward each other and give each other a huge hug, yeah. right? Right. So th those kids don't see race. They don't see color. They just see there's another kid I can play with, but it starts getting, helping the kid understand that, you know, you can play with kids that are different than you. So as they're growing up, they're building relationships with kids and, you know, teenagers and into adulthood that are different than them. I, I talked to a guy um, in, in Florida and he was telling me, he was sharing his story with me and saying, you know, he grew up in San Francisco and moved to Florida. Um, but he said growing up in San Francisco, he grew up in a very diverse community. This was a, oh, he was a white, he's a white guy. He said, I grew up in a very diverse community. So to me, this is the way things are, right? He said, but when he moved to Florida, um, he moved to a community that was just like him and he saw racism for the first time to this degree. Um, and when he moved to, the, to, to his city in Florida and he was just saying that, you know, as a kid, his understanding was just everyone's the same. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, everyone's the same. But so to answer your question and to get back to your question, it's parents just need to expose their kids and build an awareness within their kids with people from different cultures and be intentional about it, whether it's at the church, whether it's at a community park or whatever it is, just start being intentional about building relationships with kids and then with 
their parents that are different than you. And that's how you do it. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, talking about experience. I mean, you were sharing about your friend's experience going from San Francisco to um, to Florida. And before I came to Central, I was in the Bay Area in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. And I, I would just experience culture in such a different way within my apartment complex alone. I'd be walking down yeah. and just the foods I could smell, uh, the kids yeah. I could see playing on playgrounds. Um, and I would say it was very different from the suburban white neighborhood I grew up in, in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such a good point that experience can sometimes be uh, the best of teachers when it comes right. to uh, just putting yourself uh, into, into areas where you can learn. Um, and I would say, you know, with experience, I think food is another way yeah. <laughs> where you can really get outside of your comfort zone and, uh, and just learn more about right. others. I just remember growing up and, uh, going to this Euro restaurant and, uh, kind of having Mediterranean food, which, you know, 10 year old me is like, it's not a cheeseburger. It's not chicken fingers. Like, what am I doing with this? Um, right. But it was those experiences, like going to that restaurant, meeting the family that owned it, and then just becoming regulars and friends with them. Yeah, Stuff like that yeah. is like, I think, great and can push you outside of your comfort zone. So, Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, yeah. awesome. Do you got any local restaurants here in, uh, in Phoenix that you think are like your top, top go-tos? You know what? I... There's some. Yeah, there's some. I like uh, Carolina's. It's down in uh, Phoenix. I don't know if you've been there before that's an awesome mexican restaurant i love uh, carolinas i've got one yeah. not far from where i live so it's a yeah. good one <laughs> yeah that's one i really really like <laughs> well very cool very cool so dr mcgee uh before we close our time here together uh could you just explain why does it matter you know why does this conversation matter why does uh, the work that you do and, and the topics that you research and write and talk about why is it important yeah, I think the most important thing, and I, I reference, I can't remember top of my head, it was in John, uh, chapter John, or the book of John, chapter 7 or 17, I can't remember top of my head. When Jesus was praying, um, and it's actually the longest prayer that Jesus prayed, and in that prayer, Jesus said something that was really transformative for me in my work. Jesus prayed and said, God, I want them, and I'm paraphrasing, God, I want them to be united as we are not united. And his reason was, I want them to be united so they can be an example to the world. And when I reflected and meditated on that, that hit me really hard. The church and our unity is an example to the world. So the question is, if the church looks like the world, and acts like the world, how are we going to get the world to know Jesus? And we have to have, the church has to get to this place of unity. The church is, is over 2,000 years old, and we're still fighting <laughs> cultural and ethnic and racial issues. 2,000, it dates back to the Bible, to the book of Acts. Yeah, right. When we were having problems. And we're still, two, over 2,000 years later, we still cannot get this figured out because we always want to separate people. So my work and what I do and, I, and my passion and my purpose in life is educating people on how we build unity. Again, not just racial unity, Christian unity. Jesus divided us into two categories. You're either in the kingdom or you're not. He didn't say you're in the kingdom, and then now there's these subcategories. He said you're a Christian, you're not. He is a Christian, but you're in the kingdom or you're not. Yeah. So what I believe, and I'm working extremely hard for, and I'll continue working extremely hard towards, is helping people understand that we are all one. We are one body in, in, of, of Christ. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter your gender, where you were born, how much money you have or don't have, if you accepted Jesus as your personal savior, you are a believer in Christ, you're united with your other brothers and sisters. And that's as simple as, I, as it is. So that's where my work starts and that's where it's going to end <laughs> uh, with this message to, to everyone. 
Amen to that. Like it's so good. And you're, you're totally right. You know, this, this isn't a problem. It's not a new problem that we're facing. Yeah. It's, it's something that has happened in the early church. Uh, you mentioned acts. I even think of, you know, Romans and Paul's talking to yeah. them like, Hey, like the Gentiles and the Jews and the Romans, no one's getting along. And, uh, and so it's not something that uh, unfortunately is going to go away overnight. And, you know, I think as we continue to work, as voices like yours are heard and continue uh, to share the message that you're sharing, uh, the the hope and promise of what Jesus promises uh, will come day by or day by day. So I appreciate you. I, I thankful for you. I'm glad you're part of uh, Central and just our community and all the work you're doing. Where can people, as we uh, close, where can people find you? Do you got Twitter, social media, website? How can people continue to hear uh, about the work you're doing and just learn from you? Yeah. So um, I have two websites, but the, the main website you can go to is uh, drjeffmcgee.com. Um, my company's website is cross, uh, sorry, ccdynamics.org is the company website, but my personal website is Jeff McGee, drjeffmcgee.com. And, and on that site, you can connect with me on uh, social media. Um, you can send me an email. Um, my book is on the, uh, my personal website, drjeffmcgee.com website. And if people just want to talk or I extend an invitation to go out and grab a coffee with anyone who just wants to learn more and just talk, build a relationship. I'm, I love doing that. So just shoot me an email. We'll schedule a coffee meeting and we'll, we'll head out and start the conversation. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us on this, uh, this episode of Beyond the Lines podcast. And to those who are either watching us on YouTube or listening to us in some other fashion, I uh, just want to th- say thank you to you as well. We record here out of Central Christian Church. Uh, we're in the greater Phoenix area, and we've got a few different campuses, but you know, we believe our cause, our just cause, is to love beyond. So we want to love beyond the lines on this podcast. And uh, if you would like to learn more about us, maybe join us in person for services or just hear more about what we're uh, hear more about what we are about, you can join us on centraleasy.com. Uh, beyond that, thank you so much for listening and we will see you guys later.